Hi, this is Pastor George Williams with God's Purpose Ministries. What you're about to see is a message that I recently preached at Holy Trinity Armenian Church called The Miraculous Wedding. It is a powerful and informative message, not only about the first miracle of Jesus Christ at the wedding feast of Cana, but I also go into great detail about how the Galilean wedding is actually a key in unraveling Bible prophecy concerning the return of Jesus Christ in the rapture. God bless you as you watch. Please be sure to like and subscribe. Like on the video, subscribe to our channel. Uh, be sure to share this video with friends. And also, if you don't mind, leave a quick comment. God bless you as you watch. Let's go for the Lord in prayer just quickly. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we ask that today you would speak to us, reveal, reveal to us, Lord God, your truth. Lord, encourage those who need to be encouraged and draw us closer to you, Lord God. Help us to have our hearts right with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So today's message is Emmanuel Invited. We're, doing, we're continuing in the series for this year about Emmanuel, which is Jesus, God with us, amen? amen? And today we're going to talk about a miraculous wedding. But uh, this week has been a long week for me. Uh, my father-in-law, Marcos Sunyan, um, who was very much like a father to me, passed away back on January 7th, and this past Tuesday was his funeral. And uh, it was a very moving memorial service. Um, but it's been a very busy week with all the other activities and things going on surrounding that. But you know, as I sat there uh, during the service, and listening to uh, the speakers remind us, you know, all about his life and his impact on us, on all of us, um, the thought came to me that, you know, funeral services and memorials and these type of things that follow, they're not, uh, when we gather together, it's not for the sake of the one who's passed away, right? I mean, they're, they're gone, right? So it's not for their sake, it's really for ours. It's, it's, uh, it's for those of us who are left behind. And it's uh, gatherings like these, you know, that help us to process our grief. And anyway, you know, I just wanted to say that Mark you will be missed uh, by a lot of people. And he was an incredible person. So anyway, today's message, though, is not about a funeral. Today's message is about a wedding. Now, let me just give you guys a little bit of background uh, about a Galilean wedding. So Galilee is, area, is the area in the north of Israel, uh, near the Sea of Galilee. And... Uh, there are cities in that area like Bethsaida, you've probably heard of some of these, Bethsaida, Capernaum, Cana, Nazareth. And so uh, these, place, these places were under Roman, under Roman control and ruled by Tiberius Caesar. And life was very harsh in the first century for God's people. And, uh, but a wedding, a wedding was the most important celebration, the most important event in any town for any person anywhere in this area. It was like such a celebration. And the reason for that is because even though they were under such harsh living conditions, a wedding was uh, that event that brought hope, that brought hope of, of a future, you know, and a promise of a new beginning. And so people really got excited about weddings. So we're going to uh, stand through, if you don't mind, we're going to read the Word of God. John chapter 2, just 11 verses, verses 1 through 11. Is that on the screen yet? Uh, what I read may be a little bit different than that. I'm reading from the Amplified I would like to do studies in the Amplified Bible. So mine might be slightly worded differently, but it's still a word of God. Amen. So John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine was all gone, the mother said to, said to him, They have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, Dear woman, what is that to you and to me? My time to act and to be revealed has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to do, to you to do, do it. Now there were six stone water pots there, 
for the Jewish custom of purification, for the ceremonial washing, containing 20 to 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Then he, took, then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter of the banquet. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the, wa the water, which had been turned into wine, not knowing where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called to the bridegroom, and he said to him, Everyone else serves the best wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then he serves that which is not so good. But you have kept, the, kept back the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs attesting miracles, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, displaying his deity and his great power openly. And his disciples believed confidently in him as the Messiah they adhered to. They trusted him and they relied on him. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So, verses 1 and 2 give us a setting. Verses 3, though, we pick up where it says, this would have been extremely embarrassing. So, so the wine is all gone. And Mary's like, like freaking out. Like, oh no, this can't be happening. The wine is all gone, so she runs to tell Jesus. So this would have been very embarrassing for the father of the groom because he's actually the one who paid for the wedding and takes care of all the festivities. And it would have been very, excuse me, very embarrassing for the groom, obviously, because, I mean, you run out of wine, the whole celebration stops. So this was a, not a good situation. And Mary, of course, you know, didn't want to see them be the laughing stock of the community, you know, because, I mean, that would just be... I know to us now, 20 centuries later, we're like, all right, so they ran out of wine, you know. Pop a Corona, I don't know. <laughs> you know, do something else, we'll figure it out. Just drink seven of them, I don't know. But, you know, so for us, it's not, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but to them, it was like a catastrophe, it was a disaster. And Mary knew this. So she takes it upon herself to get involved. Now, verse four and verse five really cracked me up, because Mary's funny. She's, so she goes and she tells Jesus, right? She comes to Jesus almost butting into the situation, you know, it's, it's like kind of really none of her business, but she's like trying to pull Jesus into it too. She's like, you know, they're out of, they're out of wine. What are we, we going to do? And Jesus is like, what is that to you? And why are you trying to follow me? What, what do I have to do with this? He says, my time has not yet come to be revealed. It's not my time yet to act. And then she just like totally ignores Jesus. Did you notice that? Did you read the story? Did you see what he said? She just said, she didn't even address what he said. She didn't even acknowledge. He, he said, woman, what is that to you and to me? Why is that our business? She's like, to sort of, whatever he says, just do it. You know, she didn't even, like, like, you know how moms can be. Anybody have a mom like that? If she wants something done, she doesn't even, you say no, she doesn't even hear you. No, she won't. In one ear and out the other. My mom's kind of like that. She wants something done, you know, she, she'll get her way. So, you know, she, she basically just ignored Jesus and just said, turned to the servant, just totally blew him off and said, whatever he says to do, do that. So, I don't know, I just I crack up when I read that. So anyway, um, so she didn't even like take no for an answer. So let's take a minute to look at Mary for just a second. There's three things that we learned about Mary from the scriptures. One, she was a woman of faith. So you remember 30 years earlier when, they, when the angel Gabriel came to see her when she was a young lady, right? And he comes in and starts to tell her about the plan of God and that she's going to conceive a child and, you know, bring forth a son. And so Mary's, Mary did two things. She, first she questioned. She's like, well, hold on a second. Well, how is that going to happen? You know, I'm not even married. How am I going to have a child? And so once the angel explains to her that the Spirit of God is going to come upon her, what does she say? She says, let, let it be as you have said. So she took God at his word, right? So she questioned, how, this, how is she going to bear a child? Once it was explained, she says, well, then let these things be used as you have said. So she took God at his word. So she was a woman of faith. Then she was a, also a servant because the next thing she says is, I am the Lord's handmaiden. I am the Lord's servant. So she made herself, she said about herself that she was a servant, okay? And then the last thing, what we just read right here, this is the only verse in Scripture where Mary gives a commandment. There's only one commandment ever given by Mary. And what is her commandment? Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. So the reason I bring this up is because uh, many people lift Mary and exalt her almost to the point of being like a goddess. You know, they almost worship Mary. And I just wanted you to look at what the scriptures say about her and that the fact that she was a woman of faith, yes, absolutely, God chose her. 
But she even called herself a servant and a handmaid. She didn't make herself something to be worshipped or idolized. And thirdly, she only had one commandment. And if you're going to honor Mary and you want to venerate Mary, you want to you know, give some kind of honor to Mary, then do what she said. What did she say? Whatever Jesus says, do that. So do what, do what Jesus says. So what did Jesus say? Well, a lot of things, but one right off the top of my head is John 3, 3. And Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, a priest who came to see him at night because he didn't want all the other priests to know that he didn't have all the answers and he was going to see Jesus to get some insight. So Nicodemus says to Jesus, we know, Master, that you are from the kingdom of God. And Jesus stops him. Hope, oh, stop right there. He says, unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom of God. So don't talk about the kingdom of God. You, have, you, don't, you don't even know what you're talking about. So Jesus said we have to be born again. So I just wanted to encourage any of you that um, venerate Mary. You know, listen, if you want to venerate Mary, then do what she said. She said do what Jesus said. And just a side note. Uh, Mary had other children with Joseph. Their names are recorded in Matthew 13, 55 and Mark 5, 3, 6, 3, sorry. And these are the names of his brothers, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon. And it says, and these are all of his sisters. So it doesn't say both. So we know it's at least three. It said all of his sisters. So that's seven siblings plus Jesus. So Mary had eight children. So for those who think that she was a perpetual virgin for like the rest of her life, I don't think eight kids would quite qualify as that. So anyway, it's right. <laughs> a lot of kids. So anyway, so her and Joseph had other children. So Joseph, I mean, Jesus had a lot of half brothers and sisters. All right, well, so let's pick it up at verse six. So now there were six stone pots that were full that, uh, for the Jewish custom of purification. And they each contained 20 to 30 gallons each. So I got to go by the water store later on. So I thought I'd bring it to me. <laughs> we'll fill this up. This is five gallons, as you probably know, right? So picture how big these water pots must have been. They're like 30 gallons. That's six of these, each one. And there were six of them. That's a lot of water. Now, they didn't have hoses and, you know, big fire hoses to fill those things up. That's what I would use if I had to fill up something that big. I, you know, they didn't have garden hoses. They pumped it out of the well or doing it bucket by bucket by bucket. It must have taken them a while. But all I'm saying is that if this is five gallons and each one of those six uh, pots was six of these, that's a lot of water. Which means that's a lot of wine, by the way. So, <laughs> that's a lot of wine. That should last. That'll last them for the next couple of weddings. So, they filled these up. And it says that they filled them all the way to the brim. Okay. And this is uh, the part that kind of, you know, I think about. When I, when I read the, the Word of God, I always try to just like, step back and kind of just... Don't get like sucked in, like, step back for a second and think about what it's really saying. Get the big picture. So these guys, they do what Jesus said. They fill it up, right? And he says to them, now take some out and take it to the head waiter of the banquet, the guy in charge. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was that servant and, I, and this guy who didn't even want to have anything to do with it, he's like, he, you know, he's like thinking this son of this lady who's pushing in and like, Butting in, and this guy didn't want to do anything about it. He says, fill up the water. Now, I just put the water in the buckets, in, the, in these pots. I just filled it up. I know it's water. And you're telling me, just scoop it out and take it to my boss? The head waiter? He's like, dude, you're risking my job. You want me to, I know that's water. I just put it in there. It's water. You want me to take it to the, the head guy and tell him, taste this. This is great wine. That's foot water, man. That's the water for the washing of their feet and their hands. You want me to take some nasty foot water and give it to the head guy and tell him, here, drink this, and then he's going to be excited about it? I'm going to lose my job. Are you crazy? All right, that's just me. Maybe you guys don't, maybe you don't think the way I think. That's, that's what I'm thinking when I read that. I'm like, wait, this guy, had, this guy had to have some faith. He had to have some faith. Jesus said, take some out and go take it to the guy. And, Jesus, and the guy's like, uh, take some of the foot water, right? That's what you're telling me to take that over there. So anyway, he's probably thinking, said, this pushy lady and her son are telling her, fill up a you know, you fill these pots up with water, and now i got to take it to my boss. So, anyway, it took faith. So then we pick up in verse 9. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which was turned into wine, not knowing where it had come from, though the servants who drew the water knew, right? That guy knew. And he's probably holding his breath. Can you imagine? He takes a, pours a cup of it, right? Gives it to his, his boss. His boss like, starts to drink it. The guy's like, <laughs> like, oh, no. He's about to drink foot water. I'm dead. He's, he's probably shaking in his boots as he's watching his boss drink this. But then he's, he's shocked, obviously, when the boss says to him, 
This, everyone else serves the best wine first and to wait so people have drunk freely. See, but you have saved the best to last. And this was the first of the Jesus' miracles that he did in the land of Can in, in Cana of Galilee. So, you guys follow that story? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, cool. Because now we're about to shift. We're about to turn a corner and go another direction. So let's go, about, let's go back about one year prior to this, before this wedding. And I'm going to teach you a little bit about the Galilean wedding and the customs of the day. See, the Galilean wedding was much different than weddings of other cultures in that area. It was much different. They had a unique way that they celebrated a marriage. And uh, as it turns out, this is also the key to Bible prophecy concerning the return of the Messiah. So Jesus was not just a Jew, but he was a Galilean, right? He was from Galilee, he was from Nazareth. Remember I listed some of the cities in Galilee, Nazareth was one of them. So Jesus was a Galilean, and so were all of his disciples, except for Judas. So all of his, I guess you might say his real disciples, were Galilean. <laughs> so they were all uh, Galilean. So you notice that Jesus in his life, when he spoke, he told parables, he told stories. He wanted to make the truth of the kingdom of God relatable to people. So when he spoke with fishermen, he would talk about, you know, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You know, he would talk to uh, a farmer about, you know, planting seeds, sowing seeds, about different kinds of soil, tilling up the ground, these types of things. So he always wanted to make it relatable. So when his disciples had questions about the return of the Messiah, about the end times, about the last days, Jesus decided to use a Galilean wedding as his parable to explain to them how these things would come to pass and how these things would unfold. And it's pretty fascinating as you, when you start to dig deep into it. So here we go. So the process began with the betrothal or the engagement. Now, there was, it was a ceremonial time and there was a ceremonial cup. So what, what would happen is the father of the groom would write out this proposal, this uh, covenant, and when the, when the city would f found out that there was a betrothal happening, they would begin to gather. People just coming out of the woodwork. They wanted to see it. They wanted to be a part of it. Because remember, I told you that a, a, a wedding in this time was the most important event of, of, of all. It was like, what, a wedding? A betrothal? Someone's getting engaged? And they would do it at the city gates where the elders of the city sat so that there'd be lots of witnesses. And so everybody would be flocking to the city gates to come and see this take place. So as the people gathered, there was a written proposal by the father of the groom, and he read it aloud so everyone could hear. It was a contract, it was a covenant that the bride had to agree to. And then gifts were exchanged, and the most extravagant gift was given to the bride. Okay. Now, the bride price, as, as some might call it, or a dowry was paid, but it wasn't paid in a Galilean wedding. It wasn't paid to like purchase a bride for his, his son, the groom. It was actually given to the bride to take care of her in case Something happened to her beloved. And it was given to her so she could prepare for the wedding that was to come. It was, he was providing for the bride so that she would have what was necessary for the wedding that was to come. Now, why is that? Well, because this is a very interesting thing. So with Galilean weddings, the groom and the bride didn't live together for a year. So he proposes to her, and then they don't live together for a whole year. They're, they stay apart for a year while they're making preparations for this wedding. So, you know, in other, in other cultures that were in this region, they would just get married go live together. But they, they stayed apart for a whole year. So the bride price was given to the, to, the, um, to the bride to not only take care of her in case something might happen to him, but also just in case uh, for the expenses that she was going to incur because she had to go make her wedding gown and her bridesmaids and whatever other things that she needed to do. So that's what the, uh, the price was. But now we come to the cup of joy. So what would happen is the, the groom would take a pitcher of wine and he would pour it in the ceremonial glass. No, there's no wine in here. We drink the wine. No, I'm kidding. Somebody snuck up here. So he would pour the wine and then he would very reverently, very cautiously, very lovingly he would extend it to the bride. Now, unlike other cultures in the area where marriages were arranged, marriages were very, you know, women didn't really have a lot of rights in those days, but in this, in, in Galilee, it was different. 
The bride had all the power to either accept or reject his proposal by either accepting, receiving, and drinking from the cup, <clears throat> or by pushing the cup back. So the, the groom approaches and extends the cup of joy to the bride-to-be. Now, she would, basically everybody was like holding their breath at this moment because everyone's like, uh oh, <laughs> what's she gonna do? Is she gonna take it or not? You know, everyone's like, are waiting, are we gonna celebrate or are we like, oh, that's who got slammed. <laughs> you know, it's like, man, that guy's gonna be embarrassed. Can you imagine? And she's like, oh, no, it's all right. And like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, play it off. You no, know, I was gonna drink it myself. I just wanted some wine for myself. I don't know, who, who are you people? What are you guys doing? You know, so he'd be very embarrassed, but in this case, let's say she takes the wine, right? She takes the cup, and she drinks from it, sealing the covenant, that she's agreeing to the covenant that the father wrote, okay? And then gives it back to the groom, and then he drinks of the cup. And then he says something very interesting. He, he makes, he, he declares, and makes this announcement publicly that you, talking to the bride, you are now consecrated to me by the law of Moses, and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it with you in my father's house. Have you heard those words before? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so, at the Last Supper, Jesus said something very similar to his disciples. And they themselves, they had heard those words before. So when Jesus is sitting at the Last Supper with his disciples and he said these words, they would have remembered their own betrothals if they were married or they've heard other people say these same words. In Matthew 26, 29, in Mark 14, 25, and in Luke 22, 18, Jesus said, I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus was basically saying, this is a new covenant in my blood. It's a promise that we will be together again. And we're going to mark it by drinking this wine. So breaking bread, drinking the wine together is a symbol of a union. It's a common union or a communion that was taking place. And basically what it really boils down to is that as this, the, the betrothal was sealed with the cup, right? In the, in the marriage proposal, it's sealed with the cup. Jesus was doing the same thing with his disciples. He was sealing his promise to them with the cup that I will come back for you. He said, I will, I'm not going to drink this again until I drink it with you anew again in my father's kingdom. So there was a lot involved, but as disciples, as Galileans, they would get that. See, we, 2,000 years later in America, we read these words and we're like, okay, you know, we don't get it. They would have completely understood that what Jesus was saying is, this is an engagement party. This Last Supper was like an engagement party. It was, an, it was a betrothal. You get that? So it was sealed with the cup. And, and uh, these, these Galileans would have clearly understood that. So back to the wedding process. So once the betrothal was sealed and lots of celebration, now the real work began because the groom would now leave for about a year. And over the next year was a time of preparation. So the bride and groom did not live together for a year, like I told you earlier. They'd now live apart. And the groom would spend his time gathering building materials and supplies, and he would start to build a room onto his father's house. He'd go home to his father, and he would extend the house out. You following? Some of you are already smiling. You kind of get it. He extends the house out. Like he built onto it. He adds onto it where he and his bride are going to live. So remember, what, what did Jesus say? He said, I'll not drink this cup again until I drink it with you. Where? In my, in my father's kingdom or in my father's house. So Jesus was, go, so the, the groom would go and he'd start buying all the building supplies, start building, he's adding his big room onto the side of his house. That's how they did, they built a home, and they just added rooms, added rooms, added rooms, added rooms. So the house just kept getting bigger and bigger with the more kids and the more, uh, more we got married. So, so the, the groom during this year is building onto the house. And the bride during this year is preparing herself, amen, for the wedding to come. So the groom has to go out, not only build onto the building, but he's also building furniture, buying rugs and, and lamps and lanterns and things and dishes and all kinds of stuff. I know 
In our society, these are the women, I guess, do all that stuff. You know? <laughs> Weddings come in for matching dishes and matching towels. And <laughs> but in their society, the man, the, the groom was preparing a place to bring his bride where everything would be completely prepared and taken care of already. So in John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus said to his disciples, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions or many rooms, some say, right? There are many rooms. If it was not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that you may be there also. So Jesus says these words to his disciples at the Last Supper. They get it. They get it. They're like, oh, okay. He's giving us like an engagement promise, which means he's going to his father's house to build a place for us. He's going to come back for us and take us there to be with him. We have his promise. So the bride would spend the next year preparing herself for the day when the groom would come to get her. She would gather fabric, materials, and other things for her wedding dress and her veil and, uh, and also help prepare her bridesmaids. So the bride was to remain always ready for her groom to return for her and to take her home to be with him. So who's the bride? We are. Us. We are. Exactly. So our job is to be prepared. Now, researchers have discovered something amazing about a Galilean wedding that's different from every other wedding. And that is, is that the Galilean wedding was what you might call a surprise wedding. You're like, what do you mean a surprise wedding? <laughs> How do you have a surprise wedding? Well, during the entire year of preparation, the bride and the groom don't know the day of their marriage. They don't know what day they're getting married. They're engaged, they're betrothed, but they don't know the day of their marriage. In fact, no one in the whole town knows the hour or the day when the groom will be sent to get his bride. No one except one person. Yes. The father. The father of the groom is the only one who knows the day when he'll set for them to be married. So this whole time, the groom is building, adding on to the house, building furniture, buying rugs, and buying all these things, and getting everything ready, and getting the wedding feast ready. So not just a place, but the feast. He's getting all these things ready, and meanwhile, the bride is buying the materials and tracking these things down. This can take months, you know, in this day and age. They didn't just, like, go down to, to you know, Walmart or Joanne's, get some fabric, you know. <laughs> they got to pay me for that plug there. Anyway, uh, you know, they, they uh, it was hard to find these things sometimes, especially if you live in some small little town, you know, you didn't have, you have to go find these merchants. And, so anyway, it would take a while, it took a lot of work, but... The whole time they're doing this, preparing for the wedding, none of them, neither one of them, and no one else in the whole town knows when the wedding is going to be. They don't even know what the, what the date is. Someone says, hey, when are you getting married? I don't know. <laughs> Aren't you engaged? Yeah. When are you getting married? I don't know. Soon, hopefully. I don't know. When the father sends the, the groom for his bride, that's when I'll get married. And so no one knew except for the father. So... So the disciples would have definitely recognized this whole setup, the way that Jesus was laying it out to them when he was explaining about the end times and his, and his return. Because they kept saying, when will the Son of Man return? You know, when, when will be the, the coming of the Son of Man? They kept pestering Jesus, trying to find out when, when, when. And so Jesus began to explain it to them through, the, through this analogy or the parable of this wedding. So I know that some of you recognize that phrase, right? He said, no one know the hour nor the day. So it was, it was a surprise wedding, right? No one knew the hour nor the day except for the Father. So during this entire year, no one knew, only the Father. In Matthew 24, 24, 36, and in Mark 13, 32, Jesus said, Concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor even the Son, only the Father. So be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And Peter warns us in 2 Peter 3.10, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It will come like a thief to those who are, not, who are unprepared and those who are not ready. For the bride and her bridesmaids and all the invited guests, they actually slept in their wedding garments. 
Can you imagine that? They slept in their wedding garments, the bride and her maidens. Every night, once the, once the bridal garments were completed, they slept in them, waiting because they didn't know. And they had to be ready because it could come any time. So they slept in their wedding garments. So they were ready. They were prepared. So the Father, we're giving us a little bit of insight to show us that the Father will send the Son back to get his bride in the night. So it says, like a thief in the night. But only a thief if you're not ready, right? If you're ready, then it's not like a thief in the night, but it is in the night. And the disciples would have, would have known this because this was actually the way that they all played out. While it says no man knows the hour nor the day, it actually, they knew at least one thing, it actually was going to be at night. Now, when they say at night, it's not like, and when you look at the spiritual side of it, what Jesus is saying, it doesn't mean the rapture is going to happen at night, because it's not night everywhere, right? It might be night here, but it's not night in China when it's night here. What he's saying is that night is a, is a time of darkness and a time when most people are unaware and unprepared and are asleep, like spiritually sleeping. So what Jesus was saying is, he's going to come when you don't expect him. That's when, his, that's when he's going to come. So this, this uh, uh, phrase that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night was simply saying that he's coming as a thief to those who are asleep and for those who are unprepared. But the disciples of Jesus would have understood this because it was their custom that weddings begin in the middle of the night. The wedding procession would always begin in the middle of the night. So when the groom finished preparing the place in his father's house and the, the, the festivities are all set up, everything's, the place is ready, the... Um, uh, the feast and the festival or the, the marriage feast is ready, everything's set up. He would go to his father and say, okay, everything's ready. I'm ready. And the father would say, I'll let you know. <laughs> you think he's going to say, all right, go get, go get it. No, he said, all right, good, I'll let you know. And he's like, what? Oh, I'm waiting for a year to be with my bride. <laughs> What's up? Let me, I want to go. And he's like, okay, well, I'll let you know. Until the sun sets, they go to sleep. And soon, no one knows when, who knows? Just the Father. Soon, one night, the Father wakes the son and says, go get your bride. Go get her. And he wakes up. All of a sudden, he's wide awake. He jumps up, and he grabs his shofar horn. He blows it. I'm not going to blow this one. I don't know how to blow it. But. So anyway, he blows, he sounds the alarm. He blows the shofar to warn and give a notice to not only the bride and the bridesmaids, but everyone, all the invited guests in the town. Now is the time. The trumpet sounds, and the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming for his bride. So the sun rises up. He jumps up, he grabs the shofar, he blasts the horn, and, he's, and the procession begins, and it winds through the streets of the city, and all those who are ready are also sleeping in their wedding garments, and they come out and join the procession as it winds through the city, making their way to the bride's home. So, as he's sounding the alarm, and as they're winding through the city, people who are ready are gathering in. So, finally, after a year of preparing and waiting, the bride and groom are finally reunited. And I can imagine this scene. The groom's coming up, his father's with him. Big procession of people behind them, supporters, people who care, people that have been invited. And there's the bride. And all of her glory and her splendor, and there's her bridesmaid standing there waiting. And finally, after a year, separation, after a year of longing, after a year of waiting to be together, finally, they're reunited. But listen to this. The bride doesn't just like jump in line with the, with the rest of the procession and just follow the groom to the father's house. No. There was something called a, a litter. That's what some people call it. The bride doesn't just follow, but she's actually carried away. She's lifted into the air. She's lifted off the ground, it says. In the original language, they actually called this flying the bride. 
to the Father's house. So it was kind of like a stretcher thing, or like a chair thing, like you've seen in some of the older... Hmm, exactly. So the bride, they, the, 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 the attendants would come, the, some of the big brothers, they could, the carrier, would set it down and she'd kind of step into it and would sit on it like a chair with like these long poles and they would lift her up and carry her. What does that sound like? Don't say it here, say it. <laughs> what does that sound like? The rapture. It says, the bride is lifted off the ground, lifted up and carried, taken away to the Father's house. She would actually be carried all the way there. So this sounds a lot like the rapture to me. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, a command, and the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet, hello, trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall be the first to rise. And after that, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The bride is off the ground in the air to meet the Lord and forever to be with the Lord. So once all the guests arrive at the Father's house, so they've lifted the bride, they've carried her to the Father's house. Now once they get to the Father's house and all the guests have arrived and everyone's inside, the doors are slammed shut. Boom. The doors are closed. And no one goes in and no one goes out. Sometimes it's three days, sometimes seven days. No one went in, no one went out. If you didn't make it on time, if your lamp wasn't wasn't burning bright, if you didn't have your wedding clothes on, you weren't ready when the procession came by your house, now you're running down the street, wait, 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 boom. You could bang on that door all you wanted. They were not opening that door. You've been left behind. So the primary concern that everyone has, though, when we talk about the rapture, everybody always asks one question, when, right? Everyone wants to know when, 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 when. Well, as we've already read, Jesus said no one knows the hour nor the day. Not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son of God. So why are we so caught up in when? It's not for us to know. If it was for us to know, we would know. People are always trying to figure out when exactly. And in fact, they did, they've done some uh, surveys recently. 36% of Bible-believing Christians... 36% believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, meaning that the rapture is going to take place before the years of tribulation. 4% say that it's a mid-tribulation rapture, meaning about halfway through the seven-year tribulation, that's when the church will be taken. That's when the bride will be taken home to be with the Lord. 18% believe it's post-tribulation rapture, meaning after the tribulation happens, after all the wrath is poured out, then the saints of God and the bride of Christ will be taken home. 13% believe it's some other variation, 4% just, haven't, just don't know. Say, That's just an answer that I don't know. But that leaves 25% that no longer even believe in the rapture. 25%. And this isn't just a general survey of everyone. This is, this is Bible-believing Christians. 2 Peter 3.3 3 says this, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with their scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. So when I read this scripture, when I used to read this scripture, I used to think of people in the world. You know, oh, okay, they scoff, they laugh, they mock, they don't believe Jesus is coming back. Ah, Jesus is coming back. They've been saying that forever. He's not coming back. And I used to think that that was people outside the church that thought that. But if 25% of the church doesn't even believe in the rapture, in a literal rapture that Jesus is coming back, that means that those scoffers are actually in the church. There's a lot of scoffers in the church. That's scary. But instead of focusing on when, what is the bride's responsibility? To be ready. Exactly. To be ready. We are the bride. And our responsibility is not to wonder when, 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 and try to figure out, and maybe there's some kind of Bible code or different things going on and try to figure out, uh, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be the one that knows. Well, it's not for us to know. Is the bottom line. Just be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Luke 18.8 Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? True saving faith. Will he find faith on the earth? So the question that we should be asking is not when. The question we should be asking 
it should be who and why. Who will be ready when the groom, the Son of God, returns? Are our hearts clean? Are our sins forgiven? Are we living for God? Are we serving Him? And why is He returning for us anyway? His bride, why is He returning for us? Because He loves us. And He wants to take us home to be with Him. This world is not our home. So, be prepared. We're just pilgrims passing through. We're like in a foreign country. This, is, this world is not our home. He loves us and he wants to take us home to be with him. So he's gone to prepare a feast and he's gone to prepare a place for us. But are we ready? Are we waiting? Are we gathering? Are we inviting more guests? Are we? Are we waiting? Are we ready? Are we inviting more guests to come? And are we occupying until he comes? So before the day of wrath, let's just back up. Before the day of wrath, and I'm closing with this. Before the day of wrath, before the tribulation, before the wedding feast, before the doors are closed, before the rapture, before the thief comes in the night, take it all the way back to where it all began. with the cup. Take it back to when he offered you the cup. You remember? The question should be, will you accept this cup? Will you drink from the cup? Will you honor the covenant the Father has made with the blood of his Son? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, which is alive and active. Lord, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it does divide between the soul and the spirit, between the bone and the marrow. Lord, and it can break the chains off of our lives. We ask you, Lord, that you would move in our hearts today. Lord, as we have a little bit of insight now into the last days and you're soon to come you're soon return Lord we we know that none of us knows when Lord and it's really not even for us to know Lord we can hypothesize and we can theorize and we can try to figure these things out but Lord the bottom line is that we need to have our hearts ready and prepared for your return whenever you come whether you come tonight whether you come in five years ten years whenever you come Lord may we be ready so we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your word. May it penetrate our hearts, Lord. May it be seeds that are sown into good ground, Lord, that we would bring forth a harvest. And help us, Lord, to honor you with the lives that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, Jesus said things like, I will not drink this cup again until I drink it new with you in my father's house. Uh, what else did he say? You know, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am that you may be there also. And if I go to prepare that place for you, I will come again to take you with me to be there. Uh, it's amazing. You know, uh, no man knows the hour nor the day. Only my father is in heaven. You know, these kind of prophecies, these kind of things that Jesus was explaining to his disciples concerning his return. We're all around and centered around and focused around a Galilean wedding. So anyway, like I said, I hope you really enjoyed that. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, God bless you. Uh, please take a moment to like on this video, subscribe to our channel, share this video with a friend, and uh, leave a quick comment if you don't mind. And God bless you. We'll see you guys next time.